I got to tell you, that's that's it's worthy. Just go ahead and continue in that worship. I, I, Catherine, you ought to just go ahead and come on up and give us a concert. As it's a, uh, it is true worship. Uh, I do want to remind everybody we've got Grow this Wednesday. We've got Following Jesus on the 31st. Of course, we've already talked about the business meeting and the fellowship lunch today. There's no evening service, and uh, I want to kick off uh, my message today by reminding you, or at least making you aware, or at least emphasizing one, two verses out of Acts 11 to frame your thoughts as we delve into it. And I want you to be thinking about this as I give you kind of a review of what we're going uh, to study today and what we've been studying. But Acts 11, 25 through 26 says this, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found them, he brought him to Antioch, so that was for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and then listen to this, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And I want you to be thinking, what do you, be, what do you want to be known to being first at? What do you want Pollock to be known for being first at? Now we're studying the book of Acts and, and we're looking each day about the, each Sunday about the expansion of the church by the Holy Spirit. And I, I hope you know that his work in expanding the church continues even today. We can go to Acts 1.8 and that kind of gives us the layout for the book of Acts. 1 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's Pentecost, chapter 2. You should by witness, be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. The expansion of the church in Jerusalem is Acts 1 through 7. And all Judea and Samaria, that's Acts 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And in the next few weeks, we'll get to chapters 13 through 28. And that's the expansion of the church to the ends of the earth. Acts 1 8 is a statement of prophecy, it's not a restatement of the Great Commission. And you can go and look and and, and review some of the passages we've already studied that show that this was about the, a prophecy about the dispersion that was coming with the stoning of Stephen. Two key points are illustrated in the book of Acts. First is the priesthood of all believers, and, and there are many commentators, many scholars that try and define this in many different ways, but I'm just going to tell you the heart of the matter is the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers is about access to the Holy Spirit. The apostles had access to the Holy Spirit. We read in the deacons, Philip and Stephen had the same access as the apostles to the Holy Spirit. They performed the same signs. They preached with the same strength. And then Ananias, who was just a disciple, just a disciple like you and me, had access to the Holy Spirit just as the disciples, the apostles, the deacons did. As you and I have when we come to know him. 1 John 2.20 puts it this way. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. And if you skip down to verse 27, it continues. But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him. You, you see, when you are in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is in you, He will reveal the Word in time. For the purposes he has planned. John 14, 26. Let us know this. Jesus said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The second key doctrine that is emphasized in Acts is freeness of salvation all, to all. Now, we have a number of consensus statements that just try to define this, but... And nothing is better than Scripture. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 1 John 2, 2 says this, And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, meaning He paid it all for our sins, but not ours only, but for the whole world. You see, the whole world does not have salvation, but the whole world has the opportunity for salvation because Jesus has already paid the bill in full. 
And in John 129, really encapsulate it best for me. It's John the Baptist is in the wilderness. And he's kind of a strange looking figure. Jesus has just finished his 40 days of temptation. And John the Baptist sees him in the distance. And he tells the disciples who are around him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the Gospels presented how Christ established a church. The book of Acts records how the Holy Spirit expanded the church. And the book of Acts also documents some key leadership issues that were confronted by leaders. And, you know, we, we confront problems today. We have to deal with conflicts today in the church. Primarily then was the trouble of integrating the Jewish church and the Gentile church. Until Acts 10, the expansion of the church in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria was a matter of reaching the dispersed Jewish Christians from Jerusalem. Then you get to Acts 10, and it is about sharing the gospel with all Gentiles. And then you have uh, the conflict within the early church was uh, uh, changes in chapter 10 and, and chapter 11. It goes from just being a conflict between Hellenist Jews who are Christians and Hebrew Jews who are Christians uh, to being a, a, a conflict between the church and men that believed that you had to be good Jews to first to be, to be a good Christian. They were called Judaizers. They, they required circumcision. And eventually this conflict led to a confrontation with Peter and Paul. Remember, Paul had to Rebuke Peter. Peter actually brought the gospel to the Gentiles. But later when he's in Jerusalem, surrounded by his buddies, he shies away from the Gentiles when they come together to eat. And Paul has to rebuke him. But all this said, I want you to remember, Luke wrote the entirety of the gospel as a letter to Theophilus to convince him that the person of Christ is God, the Son of God, the Messiah, whom Israel had been awaiting. And he writes the book of Acts to carefully lay out his argument of the power of the person of the Holy Spirit. And again, it's all for that one person, Theophilus. But even though Luke intended this letter for the audience of one, the Holy Spirit intends this letter to speak to you and me today. And I think the key point that the Holy Spirit reveals to you and me today in Acts 11 is that the followers of Christ were not as known as Christians in Jerusalem, but as followers of the way, a sect of Judaism. But in Antioch, they're first called Christians. I hope that you're called a Christian today. And you need to understand this, this context in Antioch. Why they chose Antioch to be called Christians. You see, the crowds in Antioch were not Jews. Now, you've got to understand the dispersion had moved a lot of people out of Jerusalem to get away from the, uh, the persecution that was going on there. And they'd moved into Judea, Samaria, and, and then uh, even up into Syria. And it was a kind of a refuge for Jewish Christians. But the crowds that were being preached to there were not Jews. They weren't proselytes or, or converts to Judaism. They were full-on heathen Gentiles. They were folks who had no connection to the Mosaic law. They, had, they were folks who had no connection to the Mosaic customs. They were citizens. Uh, these citizens of Antioch were idol worshipers. They were corrupt. They, they had sensuality in almost everything of their culture. They were not connected to any of the various sects of Judaism. They weren't Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, Herodians, or Zealots. The people at Antioch who were following the name of the Lord Jesus were Greeks, Latins, Cilicians, Mesopotamians. They were black, white, brown. But what they had in common was that they called upon the name of Jesus as the Lord and as the Christ. That's what bound them together. And that's why they were first called Christians. So 
So let's get into the study of Acts 11. And I want to summarize a little bit, and I'm going to be kind of moving my way quickly through the verses of Acts 11. But let me just tell you a little bit about verses 1 through 15. They're about Peter's vision and his encounter with Cornelius. He's coming back and he's telling all the other disciples kind of what took place with Cornelius and his household. And, and let's pick up with verse 15. And Peter's defining statements about the events in Caesarea. It says in Acts 11, verse 15, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. When, when did the Holy Spirit fall on us, meaning Peter, in the beginning? At Pentecost. Remember, it came down as a tongue of fire. And they preached boldly the name of Christ to, to many men that had come from all over the world for that mandatory pilgrimage feast. What Peter's describing is that with the expansion of the gospel, each new Greek group that come in contact with the Holy Spirit, whatever their ethnicity, whatever their nationality, shame the same experience, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Have you experienced the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? What was the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit? First, if you go to Acts 2.47, it's changed lives. Acts 2.47 says this, And having found favor with the people, the Lord added to the number daily. And I think I preached that. That, that phrase, having found favor with the people, meant that these people, these new believers, these 3,000 people that were baptized on the day of Pentecost, were living changed lives. And the community of Jerusalem, about 100,000 strong, was looking in. And they were seeing people who had been living one way and now were living a different way. They were living according to their nature before and then supernaturally, meaning being controlled by the Holy Spirit. So that's one evidence of the Holy Spirit. The other is that they were given the power to boldly proclaim the gospel and they did. Verse 18 said, and when they heard these things, they became silent they being the people in Jerusalem are hearing this. And they glorify God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. Meaning, he's given them salvation. And this was a dramatic concession by the congregations in Jerusalem. To concede that God had also given salvation to the Gentiles. Isaiah 49, 6 prophesies this, though, right? It's too small a thing that you should be just salvation, a light to the house of Israel, to the tribe of Jacob, but you are my salvation unto the Gentiles and the ends of the earth, right? And remember, Jerusalem was the home of the mother church. And don't forget, at this point, the church was formed from Jewish converts or from the conversion of Jewish proselytes or from God-fearers. Now the whole church agrees that the gospel was meant to be shared with all people as God had promised. But as we shall see from this point forward, there, there were still some who insisted regardless that to be a good Christian, you first had to be a good Jew. In other words, salvation in Christ came only through redemption by Moses. And let me just disabuse you of that notion today. Salvation is... No other way accomplished than through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it has received no other way than submitting your heart to him and him alone. Let me continue with verse 19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia. That's uh, westward along the coast. Cyprus, which is uh, an island right off of Greece. And Antioch. This Antioch is the Syrian Antioch, about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. Preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. Verse 20, but some of them were men for Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyrene is on the Mediterranean coast. Who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the, word, the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. Let me say that one more time. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. This is no small message from Luke to Theophilus. And it's no small message from the Holy Spirit to you and me. 
the hand of the Lord was on them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. A congregation cannot turn people to the Lord unless the hand of the Lord is on the congregation. Don't get me wrong. People can be drawn to a larger-than-life personality without the hand of the Lord. People can be drawn to a social club without the hand of the Lord. People can be drawn by programs, by status, by traditions, by affiliations without the hand of the Lord. But mark this down. People won't be drawn to the Lord without the presence of the Holy Spirit who is the hand of the Lord. And we need to take that message and remember it as we try and be the presence of the Lord here in Pollock. We've got to let the Holy Spirit come into us and fill us up and let that overflow in everything we do and even how we present our faces. What we do in our living and our, our recreation and our families and our homes as a congregation. What we say, where we walk, what we think. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, And all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you go, make disciples of all nations. That means to evangelize. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that is bringing them to uh, make a commitment of faith, to take that step of faith, to announce publicly. I'm not afraid to tell you I'm a Christian. And then teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And we teach them for this reason. Ephesians 4 tells us, to no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. We need our disciples to grow up for the edifying of the body. Amen? And we do that with the hand of the Lord on us, the Holy Spirit. Verse 22. Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Now remember that when revival fell upon the Samaritans, the congregation of Jerusalem sent Peter and John to help Philip in his work there, right? It's what we call missions. We do missions. We send out missionaries, you know, to, to work together with a certain people group. And we go where God is already at work because the hand of the Lord is there. If we go someplace where God is not at work, guess what happens? Nothing. And let me give you some insights into why the church at Jerusalem would make evangelism of the Antiochians a priority. You see, it was the third most important city in the Roman Empire. You had Rome, which was the center of power. Alexandria, where they had the great libraries. And then you had Antioch. It was a city of about 500,000, a half million people. And remember, Jerusalem was only a city of about 100,000 except during the festivals, right, the feasts. And so this was a place to plant churches. This was a place to sow the seeds of the gospel. Verse 23, And when he came and seen the grace of God, he was glad. And encouraged them all that with the purpose of heart they should come continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. Now, let me pause right here for a moment and just kind of give you a rehash, a recap of what has been happening to Saul all this time. Okay? Remember Acts 7, he was standing charge of the coats of those who stoned Stephen. In Acts 8, he began a ruthless persecution of Jewish converts to Christianity. He took men and women captive to the, uh, the council in Jerusalem and gave them thumbs down. He was their prosecutor as well. And they would be put in jail or be put to death. In Acts 9, on the road to Damascus, he lost his vision, but he regained his sight. Right? And that was all through... God using Ananias. And then he traveled to Arabia for three years, returned to Damascus before ending up in Jerusalem. And all of this took place that he might fulfill God's proclamation that he would be 
uh, the chosen vessel to bear his name to the Gentiles. Now let's go back and pick up in Acts 11 with verse 26. And when they had found him, being Saul, he, being Barnabas, brought him, being Saul, to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in those days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea, meaning where the the mother church was. And this they also did and sent it to the leaders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. You see, now there's reciprocating. You see, when you plant a church, when you plant a mission... They're supposed to multiply, and you can see they're multiplying here because they're sending help back to those that originally dispatched them to do the work. I mean, when you look at Jerusalem sending of helpers to do missions beyond their home borders, and then you read about the special offering taken up at Antioch for Jerusalem, you see the biblical model for our method of doing cooperative missions and ministries as Louisiana Baptists. Amen? These boxes were going to be sent out. That's part of our mission to the world. This GROW program that we're doing right now, we're we're doing in-reach, but we're going to start doing outreach, is a mission to the world. The world begins outside these doors. It is the mission field. And I want to tell you, God has uniquely prepared us for this mission field. We know the language. Say it with me, y'all. Atchafalaya. Come on. Atchafalaya. Pretend you're sneezing. Atchafalaya. Gumbo. By the way, we're, you know, we're taking up the Georgia Barnett offering, and you can't spell gumbo without GBO. There you go. All right. Just thought that was funny. But you see, there's a lot packed into Acts 11. Not only Luke intending to convince Theophilus, but the Holy Spirit trying to get a message to us. How to be. How to live with the hand of the Lord on us. And let me go back to those two verses I I read at the beginning of my message. Acts 11, 25-26. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when they had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. You know, we talk about the first Gentile convert. We talk about the first European convert and, and, and that kind of, those kind of trivia things. But I can tell you, nothing more, speaks more powerfully to me than this first. They were first called Christians at Antioch. So why were they called Christians first at Antioch? First, number one, they believed and it caused them to live differently. Go with me back to Acts 11.21. And the hand of the Lord was on them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Now, some commentators share that prior to hearing the gospel, this multinational group of people in Antioch participated in the worship of the god of wine and they participated in the worship of saturn as god and this involved different orgies and things like that but they repented the greek word is metanoia it's a military command it means about face about face it's turning from the direction you were headed to turning direction led by the hand of the lord Two, they clung to Jesus. Do you remember, uh, uh, you might remember in Acts 17, uh, Paul is in Athens and while he's waiting there, you know, he gets stirred up to preach to them. And he goes down and talks to the philosophers, the religious philosophers in the, the city marketplace. And, you know, there's a pedestal there. They had pedestals to all, with statues all together. There's an empty one that says the unknown God. And then he tells them this. That God is not so far away that if you just reach out and grope, you will find him. 
It's his way of saying God's not more than an arm's length away from you. You reach out, you reach out. Just reach out and you'll find him. Here, we're told that they clung to Jesus. Acts eleven twenty three. 23. And when they had come and seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. And the King James Version says this, instead of continue, it says they cleave unto the Lord. They clung to Jesus. They lived differently. They grasped him and held on to him. Meaning they were committed to him. And then the third point is they lived changed lives. They became witnesses for Jesus. They became known as Christ followers. They became known as... For a whole year, the world around them saw the new believers at Antioch devote themselves to prayer and devote themselves to studying the word. They were changed. And it was evident to the people at Antioch, those 500,000 heathens. They saw that the Christians weren't just a sect of Judaism. They saw that the Christians weren't just a new face of an old religion. They saw that the new Christians weren't living according to a mosaic law or code, but they had formed a relationship with Jesus. They were new. They lived changed lives. They were Christians. So I want to close today. And Brother Lanny, if you'll come down and join me at the front, standing down at the front. And George, if you'll come on up and play. I want to ask you a couple questions. Do people know you as a new person, as a changed person, as a Christian? Let me ask you again. Do people know you as a changed person, as a Christian? If not, we can take care of it today. Everyone just bow your heads for a minute here. And let anyone that might not go Christ just to reflect on whether or not they want to be known as a Christian. Look, they're... There are a lot of things to being a Christian, but let me just tell you this. To become a Christian is just believe in Him. Admit your sin. Apologize for your wrong. Ask for forgiveness. Be ready to accept some consequences, but know He's compassionate. He's merciful. And lastly, agree to follow Jesus. Align your life with him. Repent about face. Is there anyone here today that needs to become a Christian today? No one's looking. Just raise your hand. Keep your eyes closed and your head bowed. And I just want to ask you then a, a question as a congregation. When you, when you think about the fact that they were first called Christians, in Antioch, what do you want Pollock to be first at? How about the first all-Christian community in Grant Parish? How about the first all-Christian community in the state of Louisiana, in the United States? Let me just close in prayer. Father, make us a revived city. Father, mold us in your image. Father, create in us a new name. Father, start with our congregation. Place your hand upon us. We pray in your son's name. Amen.